because process is a somewhat of a capstone class, I know it's not the class you take when you're a senior, but a lot of most people take it when they're a junior after they've had a few years under their belt. And I, I do like to talk about uh, what, what previous students have said about what they wish they had known before they started college. I know that you just recently did an assignment uh, based on this, and uh, what I include in these slides doesn't include your feedback, but I'm going to take what you said and, and add it to next year's. So one of the most popular things that people say is that they they should have gotten an early presence on uh, social networking sites like LinkedIn and Stack Overflow. And I would say LinkedIn is probably the most important as far as social networking. Stack Overflow is great for if you're trying to find the answer to a technical problem or something. But a lot of times when I hire people or I, I'm looking for you know, help on, on projects or whatever, the first thing I do is go to LinkedIn and search for someone. So if you take the time to make sure that your LinkedIn profile is up to date and it looks good and you've got all the information there, it's going to really help you in your job, in your job interviews and your job searches and uh, just, just to let people know who you are. Another thing they, they mentioned is uh, participating in hackathons and programming competitions. You meet a lot of new people, you get to see what everybody else is doing, you get to see what their skill sets are. Unfortunately our hackathon this year was canceled. It was supposed to be on March 27th and obviously that has come and gone. But um, if you get the chance to do uh, hackathons in the future or even IEEE has some programming contests that are pretty good too. So knowing some flavor of Linux is a really good idea. Um, I actually am I'm pretty much a Windows person, but in a lot of times I'm forced to either use the, the Linux operating system or even for me using the Mac operating system. I've got both. I've got Linux computers here at my house and I've got a Mac here at my house. And I have for specific reasons. Uh, but, but for Linux, a lot of security stuff you're going to use, Linux 4, it, it's just really good. If You don't need to be an expert, but what you should do is just um, install VMware and then install some sort of a Linux uh, distribution and, and somehow just you know get familiar with Linux and know the basics because you never know when you're going to be thrust into a situation where, where you need it. This is probably a, a big thing. You, you need to you're all used to using Windows or Macs and you have this nice GUI, you have this nice user interface, but a lot of times a, a command line is more practical and useful than, than the actual um, user interface. So it doesn't take much to just run a command prompt, go through some commands, take a short tutorial. A lot of times you can compile and run code uh, via the command line um, I, I do a lot of Flutter programming, and sometimes, and Flutter runs within Android Studio, which is a completely graphical um, environment, but sometimes I still go to the command prompt and run Flutter commands. So I know in, in this class, this semester, I spent one night talking about debugging. Debugging is one of the, the skills we don't really teach here at UCF, and that's why I, I spend at least one uh, class period trying to give you the basics. Uh, debugging will save you hours and hours and hours of time if you if you know how to do it effectively. Um, yeah, I know it says, well, I'd say consider changing your major. I had a TA actually uh, create these slides. But you definitely need to to, to be able to use the debugger. In, in fact, in computer science too, Heinrich gives a lecture, lecture on the 10 things he wished he'd have known uh, when he started, uh, when he was in school, and debugging is one of the things he, he cites. Just because debugging is such an important skill that, that you probably have never even tried or we don't teach here at UCF, it's, it's super important. Uh, learn the basics. An expert level knowledge of your basic algorithms is something that employers look for. So all that stuff that you learned in CS2 that you thought you'd never use, uh, a lot of times uh, interview interviewers will ask you about different things such as uh, you know depth first search, breadth first search, um, and, and things such as that. So, so you need to know uh, the basics of, of computer science really. The CS1, CS2 stuff, uh, OOP concepts, 
I know that last week in this class we we talked about OOP concepts for C sharp. And this week I know we're doing link. Uh, I had a student last year who said because of the link he learned in C sharp, he got his job. Uh, they asked him about link and he was able to answer the questions. And the guy on the spot said, "Well, if you know link, we, we can we can use you right now." So it's really just important that you know the basics uh, when you're going for a job or, or you're looking around or you're, you're trying to upgrade your job. So I do this. I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm not in a classroom except with you guys. But it's, computer science is, is going to be lifelong learning. A uh, classroom sets you up for learning the basics, but um, it doesn't really teach you a lot of the stuff that industry does. Now, I know that this is processes. In the first two weeks of this class, you guys got thrown into the deep end uh, without a lot of mercy. Um, you had to learn the different stacks. You had to learn maybe JavaScript. You had to learn uh, HTML and CSS and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's actually very difficult at UCF. We, we have all these classes we teach, but it's almost impossible to cover everything that you're going to need. So you're going to have to do a lot of learning outside of the classroom. I tend to use Udemy, sometimes I use Coursera. Um, th there are lots and lots of, of uh, places you can go for extra learning. And so I would encourage you to, to make this a part of your life. Just And even once you get a job at, say, a large company, Lockheed or Northrop or whatever, you're always going to have to be learning new things. So prepare for internships and jobs early, not last minute. Um, as with everything, life procrastination uh, really does hurt you. I know that in, in this processes class, some of you mentioned after you finished your small project how regretful you were that you didn't get started right away on developing and you, you basically did everything last minute. And as a result, the quality of what you turned in was not, not that great. Um, if you wait, anything that you wait until the last minute to do, such as you know, a job or an, an internship interview is is, is going to really uh, work against you. You really have to properly prepare so that you, you have maximal chances of getting that, that dream job or internship that you want. Spending uh, even an hour a day preparing can give you a confidence boost. So I know that sounds like a lot of time, an hour a day, but let's say I have an interview in, in, in two weeks from now. I typically will, will go into a dark room, not dark room, but a room empty and I'll practice. Um, I also have people who ask me uh, practice questions who who sort of um, you know make up some questions and then we do do sort of a mock interview and I have a lot of students come in to me during office hours or they make special appointments and I, I do mock interviews with them and I'll, I'll be glad to do that of course we're not on campus you know this semester or even next semester but if, if you're still on um, still here at UCF next year I'm always glad to do a mock interview with you and try to get you ready. Uh, there's also a pretty good book, uh, let's see, uh, Crack the Coding Interview. Um, I know there's a PDF of that floating around. I've got the hard copy book, um, but it's really good. It has a lot of really good advice. So, so definitely, you know, hit something, hit a resource such as that. Uh, projects are really good resume stuffers. I, I also encourage you to to use GitHub as kind of a portfolio for your projects. And, and try to try to have your projects really clean and put them on your GitHub page. That way, uh, when someone when you're in an interview situation or you're sending a, a query letter or a resume, you can point to GitHub and um, GitHub, like I said, makes a great portfolio. I had a student who took me for a graphics class a few years ago, and he put all of his uh, graphics uh, examples online. Um, it, the the class was built around WebGL, so it was pretty easy. And, and what was really interesting is that anybody who wanted to see the projects could run them directly from his Git, GitHub uh, portal. So anyway, uh, you you can never have too much experience in applying the algorithms you learn in the classroom. And by algorithms, I mean mostly CS1, CS2. Also, don't forget that that in um, programming languages, you learn a lot of the, the things, the uh, functional type of things and the functional approach to things. Uh, I know you're not going to be programming in Haskell, now, by the way, if you do put Haskell down on your resume, um, it does impress people because very few people know it. But, but the functional thing, Python and C Sharp have functional elements too. So just make sure that um, you do a lot of projects 
and make sure that you use GitHub or some other mechanism to, to act as your portfolio. You do need an online presence. And um, so I said the first thing when I hire people is I go to LinkedIn. The second thing I do when I hire people is go to Google and I just do a Google search for that person. And if they have a blog, I will find it and, and read the first few entries. Um, if they have a GitHub, I'll find that, like I said, and I'll, I'll see what they've done. So uh, a personal website is really good. Uh, I have RickLanneker.com, which I've had for many years. By the way, it needs an update. I, I get that. Um, but so some sort of online presence is good. Go into forums, uh, Stack Overflow, if you can you know, help people solve, solve a couple problems in Stack Overflow. Uh, you, you'll come up in, in, in searches. Remember, the first place to start is LinkedIn. Okay, uh, I always go there to look for people. Uh, GitHub is next. And, and just get into forums. Try to have a blog. Try to... Uh, Twitter is okay. They don't really search that very well. So you need to maintain and upgrade uh, your own code. Um, if you look back at your code uh, three to six months ago, um, chances are you, you, sometimes you cringe. I cringe at, at a lot of the code that I previously wrote just because it sucks. So don't be afraid to go back in and and rework code that you have, refactor it, uh, make it look neater. Um, so it's kind of an ongoing thing, especially if you're representing yourself on GitHub. Uh, you want to make sure that 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 it's, it's actually looks good and it's not embarrassing. So requirements always evolve. That, that's, that's the way computer science goes. And I know we spent a lot of time in this class uh, talking about gathering requirements. So this is sort of dovetailing with that thought. In the classroom, requirements are, are, are rigid and never change once given. Uh, but in the real world, requirements can change on a daily basis. I did a, a project for uh, the Department of Homeland Security about uh, two and a half years ago. and. I, I probably got three change orders per week. It was frustrating. I, I was getting paid for them. So it, it was okay. It helped me make, make more money. But uh, just, just kind of get used to it. Things, things change quickly, especially when you're doing government work. So the best way to overcome this is to become flexible. Um, also, this will, this will change the way you, you, you write your code. Your code should be really flexible, should be extensible. If you if you write some uh, crappy code that is hard to hard to change, you will be really really sorry. So so just get in the habit uh, of of best best principles, best practices when you write your code, especially if it's OOP code. Um, and then when you do get changes, it's not so bad. So your 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 code lives in an ecosystem where weird stuff happens. Um, You'll know what your code does since you wrote it. Okay, so you're the one who wrote it, so you understand it. But once you implement it with somebody else's code, somebody else's code is misspelled. Um, sorry about that. Like I said, my TA did these slides. I know that's no excuse. Um, so you won't have a clue as, as to what could happen with it once it's out in, in, into the, the wild. Um, your code could be, uh, at the time you wrote it, the best solution to a current problem. But six months down the road, it can be completely changed by another programmer to solve a new new current problem. Of course, that's that's one of the reasons you want to make your code really clean and extensible. Uh, the cleaner your code is, the better it's going to be received in, in different uh, situations where it happens to find itself. So I know you, you will understand what I'm talking about here. A lot of times people will get your GitHub uh, code and they'll use it uh, in their own projects. Um, or may, maybe you pass it off to someone in your class and they'll use it in one of their projects. And you, you really kind of can't predict how people are going to use your code uh, once it's out there in the wild and people are downloading it. Um, I actually write a lot of anti-forensic software. And I have, I have it featured on my GitHub and who knows what's happening with that because you know it's anti forensics which is really uh, resides in the in the security realm and i don't know if some hacker or some terrorist or some someone like that has taken my code and, and used it um, 
Uh, generally, these unintended ways are, are malicious in intent, but sometimes the unintended use can surprise you. Um, so anyway, just, just be really careful about how people, you know, in the future might end up using your code. Uh, most work is in the unlikely or edge cases. So while it's easy to figure out what the average and most likely use case for some piece of code or software is, it can be difficult to, difficult to cover all edge cases. And this is where unit testing comes in hand. I know I've, I've stressed unit testing in, in this class quite a bit. Um, I, I believe in unit and integration testing, and it's going to definitely make your, your code and software uh, much more robust and much more usable. Um, you need to have a knowledge of how to unit test, um, and it will quick, quicken the process. I, I typically use uh, frameworks. Um, I know I showed you in Visual Studio, there's a framework that you can add to do unit testing. I know that in JavaScript, I showed you how to use Jasmine for unit testing. So just come up with, you'll, you'll have to, it really only takes about a day to, to learn one of the frameworks. It, it just is not that difficult. So spend some time um, doing doing your unit testing and um, learning learning how to do it. And then, uh, as I've told you in, in this class, you need to go ahead and keep a record of your unit testing. Uh, there needs to be some sort of a table with the, with the the, the method and you know how you unit tested and what the results were. So that's going to be really important. So it's okay to ask for help. Um, I know I've had a couple, couple, several people in this class this semester, and they came to me all the time for help. And um, I think that's good. I was always had my door open to them. Um, don't like, don't sit there in in your your wherever you do your your programming for for hours and hours and hours. If you can't figure something out, a lot of times you can come and ask me or someone else, and, and in 30 seconds I can give you an answer and uh, clear something up for you. So asking for help can, can not only solve your problem, but can also quicken the process. Instead of spending eight hours working on a problem and getting completely frustrated, uh, someone might be able to help you out um, very quickly. Uh, and I know we can't go into the cave anymore, HEC 308. But I used to recommend to students going in there that there was almost always someone who could answer your question. So college is difficult. Uh, this this particular comment from was from, I think, fall semester. Uh, this student felt that um, they they actually had a, had a hard time uh, getting started. Uh, actually failed a few things. I couldn't comprehend. Um, Second bullet point is something I've already alluded to. Um, don't uh, do every project the night before. Um, that's a really bad habit. Um, it, it's just really bad because you're rushing through it, and you're not learning, and you're not doing very good work. Um, so he says, third, we all think that we can pull an all-nighter and finish up, and everything's going to be happy. But uh, it, it normally doesn't work that way. Now, I've I occasionally even now will pull all-nighters, but that's because, you know, maybe it's a weekend and I, I, there's no tight deadline. And I just want to work an all-nighter. But if you have a deadline and you're under a lot of pressure, an all-nighter almost never works. Um, get involved. This student suggested that uh, getting involved was really important. Um, join clubs uh, here at UCF, ACM, uh, Night Hacks, uh, Hack UCF. Uh, there, there are tons of ways you can get involved, and you're networking with people, you're learning from them, you know, you kind of have, have a support group. Um, let's see. You really get a different view on multiple topics when talking to people who aren't in the same fields as you. So that, that's true. Um, you, could, you could join, say, clubs that have business majors. You could join clubs that maybe are athletic in nature or whatever. So this, the fourth bullet point the student makes is that uh, meeting different people and, and just really getting used to um, that, that diversity that, that you encounter here at UCF is really important. So time management, I know in this class, a lot of you man mentioned time management after your, your first project. Um, it's one of the most important things that you need to uh, get right. Um, if, if, you, if you get time management right, see, technical things are easy to solve. You, you can always solve a technical problem. What you can't solve is that you've frittered away time 
uh, watching reruns on The Office or whatever, and and you waited till Sunday afternoon to start your assignment. So sometimes it'll seem like you don't have enough time to finish, but I can guarantee you if you're if you're really really careful about your 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 schedule, you can. Um, this student recommends you have some sort of schedule planner to maximize your time efficiency. Um, I, I generally use something like Google Calendar, um, and I, I, I have these. I use Google Calendar and I use Google Docs uh, to keep track of what I have to do. I normally plan it out very carefully in in advance for about a week, and and I try really uh, hard to stick to it. Definitely, really helps. Um, I learned this, this is a student comment, but I learned this the hard way. One time when I was an undergrad, I walked into class late, and the only class, the only, um, the only seats that were available were like in the front of the room. So I sat there, but I learned a lot more. I realized sitting in the front of the classroom, um, you, you end up learning a lot more. You interact with the professor, you interact with the other, um, overachievers who are there. So uh, I would definitely recommend uh, in the front, being in the front of the class. And I know at UCF we have these huge classrooms. And so a lot of times I teach in HEC 125 and people are sitting in the very back remote corners. Um, it's just not a good way to because you, you don't hear as well, you don't see as well. So I would definitely recommend considering you know being closer up. So this student talks about registration and some of the pitfalls to registration. Uh, plan ahead for registration. A lot of times uh, you go to sign up and you're late in signing up and course is waitlisted and you may not get in. Um, so it, it, something like that can really mess up your, your course of study if you're, if you're waitlisted and you can't get a course that you need for a semester. So definitely take uh, registration seriously and, and try your best to uh, to get there on time and, and plan ahead. So here's something uh, this student uh, mentioned, and I think it's good advice. Um, ace the easy classes. If it's an easy class, don't blow it off and say that's easy. I just won't worry about it. Take the opportunity to increase your your GPA by acing it. Okay. So some of these these classes are I know they're BS Gen Ed classes, um, but go ahead and, and and get an A and, and help your um, help your GPA. It's crucial to do well early on because your GPA gets harder and harder to, to affect as you take more classes, right? Right. So the more classes you have under your belt, uh, the, the less sway uh, any class has in affecting it. So form a group of friends, like I said, um, some sort of support group, and, and you can derive this from, say, Hack UCF or Night Hacks or ACM or or IEEE, or, or pick a group um, and just, just kind of get involved. And then that way you're, you're talking about your courses, they're giving you advice on what, what instructors they like and how they approach the, a problem or a, um, a homework or whatever. Uh, don't be a lone wolf and, and isolate yourself. Uh, chances are that the people in your study group have, have already uh, faced and, and solve some of the issues you're facing right now. Sign up for practice problems. There are a zillion websites that have practice problems like Coding Bat or um, I, I have in my programming languages class I recommend people to go to Project Euler and sign up for those or you don't even have to sign up you just go in there and do the problems. You can work through all the problems in Project Euler um, in different languages. And this third bullet point has some um, some suggestions: Elite Code, Hacker Rank, Top Code, or Geeks for Geeks. They're they're all full of practice problems. Um, you know, you can even do it while you're watching reruns from The Office. Um, every so often, I'll I'll have um, say a YouTube video playing while I'm still working because I find I find sometimes you know the work I do is is really boring, and even doing practice problems can be boring. So. Um, a lot of times I'll I'll do to do I'll multitask and I'll have something on to sort of keep me from getting too bored. 
So four things to think about before graduation. And this is from, from another student from last semester. Uh, what, what should you know to get a job? Make sure that if you're going for a job that's in a certain uh, field, you, you've studied up on it like we said before. Uh, you need to make sure that you prepare for, for interviews. What should you know to maintain lifelong employment? Well, my biggest suggestion is lifelong learning. Lifelong employment equals lifelong learning. So make sure you're ready for that. Uh, what should you, do you know to enter graduate school? Um, graduate, graduate school is, is quite a bit different than, than undergraduate. Uh, undergraduate, you have all these, these really BS classes like you know, um, your, your, your gen ed stuff. And even some of the regular CS things, I think, are just kind of pointless to a certain degree. But in graduate school, you're, you're, you're more or less picking what you really want to focus on. And so you're going to be a lot more interested in the, in the classes that you're taking. Uh, what should you know to benefit society? Um, I mean, really, just, just to, if, if you take a look at the ACM Code of Ethics, um, it actually does talk about how computer scientists should be going about their lives and their, their jobs to help benefit society. And if you get to CS1, a Dr. Dr. Heinrich gives a, a pretty good lecture on um, ethics and, and, and how, to, how to sort of approach that. Portfolio versus resume. So resume is the typical idea that employers and recruiters use to, use to find potential employees. And I can't tell you how many, how many resumes they're getting from people. It's like zillions. I used to have a friend and he'd get 200 resumes at a time. And there's no way you can really go through 200 resumes. So he would take and he'd throw them up the stairs, uh, the whole stack of them up the stairs, and he'd take like the ones that, that landed on the first 10 stairs. I know it's that really sucks, but you know, you just don't know how many people how many resumes that people get. It doesn't show a person's skills though, really. A portfolio is something that is so much better. And that's why I've been stressing this whole idea of putting your portfolio on GitHub. Typically a portfolio can either be a daily blog post, and here again I've already recommended blogs, um, or, or, or showing off your projects on GitHub. Uh, con contributions to open source projects should be linked and documented as well. Um, I actually don't do that very much, but it's a really good idea. Also, you know, we, we talked about a Stack Overflow. You know, you, you can get kind of a reputation on Stack Overflow, and that actually turns out to be a pretty good portfolio um, evidence of a portfolio also. Portfolios allow re uh, employers to judge ability rather than potential. So GPAs and resumes don't uh, allow for your ability to be judged. I know you guys all think that your GPA is important. But very few employers are going to ask what your GPA is. Um, a lot of people can get good grades and not learn anything. Uh, I've known people all my life, they, they, they finished a course, they got an A, and when you ask them something three weeks later, they had no clue what you're asking. So be careful about uh, relying on your resume. So solo working in computer science is non-existent these days, all right? So you're just not going to sit there at your desk. Now, that I, I have known people who, who really were, were lone wolf and just worked on these, these single person projects, but it's very, very rare. So you're going to need to communicate. You're going to need to communicate to programmers and non-programmers, okay? And I've talked about this in processes a lot that the, the stakeholders speak a different language. That's why gathering requirements can be so difficult in, in computer science projects because, um, you know, the way you express yourself is different than the way, say, a non-technical non person does. So a lot of times if you're working for a smaller company, um, it's even more important uh, because you're, you're having more interaction with, say, management, and, uh, which is a challenge all of its own, I can, I can tell you right now. But, and, and they speak a totally different language. So uh, just kind of keep up with your technical communications. So I know in processes, we, we have a lot of uh, computer engineers in processes. Uh, we have a lot of computer scientists in processes. I think that's probably all we have. Um, 
but it's very important that that the engineers and and computer science uh, can work together and a lot of times if you do your senior design project and it's interdisciplinary you, you learn really fast uh, what it means to work with uh, an interdisciplinary team but a lot of times when you get out into the real world you're going to be on some sort of an interdisciplinary team and it's really important that you're you at least know the language of, of engineering so you might want to take um, even a, a class an uh, intro class to engineering if, if you're not an engineer um, uh, linear algebra is super super important probability physics that's one of the reasons we 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 have you take those classes because they contribute to your overall understanding of fields outside of, of say computer computer science or even outside of uh, computer engineering so Unix philosophy uh, emphasizes linguistic abstraction and composition in order to effect computation so this this goes back to you know you gotta learn some sort of Linux, Unix, basically being comfortable with command line computing. Remember, I've already stressed somewhere along the way you got to break down and learn how to use command line. Text file configurations. I had a, I hired a, uh, several people about three years ago to work on a project one summer, and and all all of the configuration stuff was found in a configuration file that at runtime, you know, that the application would would load up and 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 read and you know get the configuration information. And they were actually surprised, and, and it was a novel concept to them. But a lot of things in the real world are, are based on these, these configuration files that tell the software how to behave. So specific recommendations for Unix philosophy. Navigate and manip manipulate the file system. And this is just a matter of sitting down for an hour or two with, with some sort of tutorial. Uh, compose processes with pipes. Here again, simple. To, it's it's easy to do. You just need to sit down with some sort of a tutorial. YouTube has a million of them. Comfortably edit a file with Emacs and, and Vim. Okay, so in all fairness, I hate Emacs. Uh, I do like Vim. Okay, um, but you can use either one. Create, modify, and execute and make file for software projects. All right, so this this takes this here again. It's easy to do once you learn sort of the syntax and uh, you know all Linux computers, Linux Unix computers come with GCC and make. And then go ahead and write some sh simple shell scripts. And you don't need to be fancy, just, just write them so you know uh, kind of the basics. So here are some examples. Find X number of files taking up the most space. Uh, report duplicate file extensions based on content, not file name. Take a list of names and properly capitalize, recapitalize them. Replace all spaces in a file name with an underscore. Replace last uh, 10 errant accesses to a web server from a specific IP address. So you, you can find a bunch of these kinds of exercises on the internet. And if you can just take some time and go through some tutorial, tutorials and, and, and read through and, and just do a few things, exercises like this, it will really benefit you. So you need to know something about system administration because you might find yourself in a situation where there is no system admin. I know here at UCF we have lots of people around, lots of IT people, and they do the, they do the stuff for us. But in a small, uh, in a small business, uh, it might, you might be it. So computer scientists ger generally sneer at the IT department. Of course, that's not you, I'm sure. Um, it's important for computer scientists to be able to uh, competently and securely administer their own systems and networks. Uh, many tasks in software development are most efficiently executed without passing through a sysadmin. Now I'll give you an example. Um, I actually manage a number of servers uh, for a lot of my projects and I have to I have to maintain the web server and, and add host headers and permissions and stuff like that and I am not an IT person in the least in fact, I, I just like doing doing IT work. I love it when there's a really good IT person in my company or, or on campus who, who can do this stuff for me. But it doesn't matter because um, I'm maintaining these these servers myself uh, for the for my uh, development projects, 
and so it's all on me. So at a certain point, you're going to have to make sure that you know at least the basics of, of how to make this work. So here are some specific uh, recommendations. You need to be uh, able to uh, administer a Linux distribution. And you don't even have to have a Linux computer. What you can do is just install VMware or VirtualBox, um, download and install a Linux distribution, and just go ahead and mess with it. That, it's, it's really easy to do. Configure and compile the Linux kernel, uh, troubleshoot a connection. That, that's also really easy to do. Um, it's actually not that easy to do sometimes, so I, I will take that, that back. On UCF's network, they actually block a lot of the things like P, uh, they actually block a lot of things like ping and trace route and stuff like that. So uh, maintain a website with a text editor. Yeah, so using like WYSIWYG. Um, WYSIWYG web editors is a really bad idea. Um, so let's talk a, a bit about programming languages now. You need to know several programming languages. There's always a best programming language for a given task. I know all of you are have learned C, you've learned Java, uh, hopefully you know um, Python, JavaScript, I would say at the very least, um, let's see, C, C++ as, 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 a, as a related offshoot, uh, Java, Python, JavaScript, C Sharp. Those are, those are the basics I would, I would definitely recommend. Um, a lot of uh, jobs require all of those. So here are some examples, C, JavaScript, Java, Prolog. I don't know about Prolog. I, I'm not sure I'd really... Uh, that's For a lot of AI work, Prolog is still uh, in use. Haskell is good not to use, but to know. C++, obviously. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a requirement for C++ here at UCF, but I think we're, we're leaning towards maybe, maybe adding that or, or substituting that or, or somehow reworking that. Assembly is good. Uh, I know that you probably learned a bit of that in, in your architecture class. Um, C, C is, is, so even though C is, is really an old language, uh, a lot of jobs are going to require C or going to require C, C skills of some sort or another. And you're going to do a lot of your programming with, with C. Um, I use C all the time now, even though um, you know, my, my, my probably preferred language is maybe C sharp but I still use C uh, under certain circumstances. JavaScript, if you know JavaScript right now, you can just about write your own ticket. It's, it's a really um, popular language. Um, there, there are lots of jobs that require JavaScript skills. Um, here in processes, a lot of you, you know, were forced to, to learn JavaScript uh, because it's a requirement for, say, Angular and, and React and React Native. Um, JavaScript, I would say, if you, if you can really get a get a good handle on JavaScript, um, you will you will definitely be um, in, in good good stead for your career. Java obviously is is one of the main staples of programming. It's it's a good language for uh, learning. It's almost I consider Java almost an academic language uh, because it's really good for learning learning OOP. And, and uh, it doesn't carry with it the requirement of, of the memory management that C does. You know, in C, you have to do uh, malloc and, and free, malloc or calloc or whatever, or realloc and free. And even in C++, you have to use new and delete. But with Java, it's got the garbage collector, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, it's also, theoretically, it's cross-platform, but I found that to be not necessarily true uh, because all computers have a JVM, which should be able to interpret... Um, which should be able to interpret on, on whatever operating system is. Java obviously is a, is a good one. Keep your skills up. I know you learned that in CS2 and OOP class, but just make sure you keep your skills up. Prolog, really good for um, logic and AI applications. 
Um, Pro Prolog actually is a very, very easy language to learn. There isn't much to it. Of course, that doesn't mean it's an easy language to, to use. It's just the syntax uh, is easy and learning it is easy, but, but it, it takes sometimes, it takes years to really uh, master it. Definitely consider Prolog. Um, I think that, that the AI class that Linus used to teach here uh, requires Prolog. Haskell, of course, you know, I teach programming languages. I think a bunch of you are, are in my PL class and we spent four weeks on Haskell. Um, it's not like you're going to learn Haskell and then use it in, in the real world, although some of the Facebook messaging um, code is written in Haskell. Haskell is a really good language, though, to um, learn principles. Okay, it's We learn Haskell so we can understand principles. And um, as sort of a footnote, a lot of these principles have, have carried over into other languages such as, such as Python and C Sharp and JavaScript. A lot of the functional stuff has cross-migrated. So learning Haskell gives you a really good background on, on, on knowing that stuff. C++, one of my favorite languages. I've written a bunch of books on C++. Um, it's, it's C, but it's, it's, it's really C with sort of an OOP layer on it. Um, now, in all fairness, C++ isn't really that that object-oriented. It's, it's not a pure object-oriented language, although people would argue with me on that point. Um, it Basically, they took C and they, they added a, an object-oriented layer to it, and it's still, it's still really C, but it gives you a lot of conveniences um, that you don't have in C with, with, with objects. Assembly, this is going to be a very uh, niche uh, usage. You, you probably won't use assembly very much uh, in the real world. Uh, I use it because I, I like to do a lot of low-level stuff and I like to write a lot of um, security applications and stuff where you really do need to get down and twiddle the bits. But compilers are very efficient now. So if you think you're going to use assembly to, say, write faster code, you're not going to. Uh, I once wrote a book and I, I, I broke into inline assembly to get a performance advantage. And my, my editor was a Microsoft um, engineer, and he just scorched me. He said, you know, today's compilers are so good that you're not going to be able to beat them by writing hand-coded assembly. And I, I'm going to agree with him. In most cases, um, it is true. You need to know discrete just because it gives you a really good understanding of, of, of what's going on. Okay, discrete, it's not like you're going to go out tomorrow and get a job doing discrete math. But discrete is, is really a class in how to think. Okay, so, so knowing discrete, you probably wondered why you were in the class, but it has, even though you might not believe this, it has made you a much better software engineer. Uh, data structures and algorithms, you know, this is really CS1. Uh, you're going to use this stuff all the time. Uh, queues, stacks, things like that. Hash lists, hash, hash tables. Um, th these are sort of the, the common staple for, for computer science. So specific recommendations for data structures and algorithms. Uh, at a minimum, you need to know hash tables, linked lists. Um, and I use linked lists all the time. I know when you, you guys got to CS1, you're, you really struggled with that. But uh, trees, uh, binary search trees, I use them all the time. Uh, directed and undirected graphs, okay, those I use less frequently. But when you need them, you really need them. So a grasp on theory is a prerequisite to research in graduate school. Uh, you need to know some of this. This is one of the critical building blocks in research, and therefore critical for anyone wanting to go to graduate school. So I know you guys glossed over the theory when, when, you, when you learned it, and you just wanted to pass the test or whatever. But, but at a certain point, it becomes uh, a staple for what you're doing. So theory is invaluable when it provides hard boundaries on a problem. So here are some specific recommendations in theory. Um, you, you should know at the very least um, these things that you learned in discrete, such as P, MP, MP hard, MP complete. Um, th these things actually do crop up when, when you have a real job in computer science. So I know that you probably all hated architecture class and thought it was boring and useless. 
but it's really it really makes a difference how you approach your programming um, your programming tasks. A good understanding of caches, RAM, and hardware memory management is gonna is gonna have you is gonna allow you to create your software so that it, it takes advantage of, of what the actual uh, architecture can do for you. For instance, you know, how do you how do you uh, allocate memory? Do you, do you allocate a bunch of small blocks or whatever, or do you allocate one big block and then then take from that? Um, it's really important to know what's going on behind the scenes so that you can optimize um, your programming. So you want to know how different operating systems work, um, how the kernels do things like system calls, paging, scheduling, um, virtual memory, things like that. It's really important because it's going to help you um, here again in designing your, your software so that it's more efficient. I'm not saying you have to be an expert, but you have to understand the basics in order to say do things like open file handles and understand what a file handle actually is understand things such as sectors and clusters just just a basic understanding will help your your software engineering specific recommendations for os um, print hello world doing the boot process see if you can figure out how to do that design your own scheduler uh, modify the page handling policy create your own file system these are so there. There are lots of these exercises you can find online, and if you just kind of run through them, go through some sort of tutorial, and run through these exercises, it will really help you a lot. Networking. I, I'm actually going to teach and PL this semester for the first time. I'm going to do one course in, in network programming. A lot of times you will you will do network programming, and if you don't understand the basics of stuff such as domains and IP addresses and ports, you're going to be lost. I had a group last year who did a senior design project that I sponsored, and they had no clue about um, how networks work. So their network programming, they spent like three months just understanding networking. And I actually, frankly, don't think they ever understood that either. Um, they, they just Basically, they just threw stuff at the problem. They threw one library or one API Added, added after another. It didn't work. They try something else, and they try something else. Had they known uh, networking from the very beginning, uh, it wouldn't have been a problem. They would have actually known what a port was, or how IP address and domains work, uh, how, how IP resolution works. So, I know that you're not IT. I know that you're not networking, but you need to know something about networking in order to do any kind of network programming. So, here are some specific. Uh, recommendations for networking. Uh, take a look at the, the, some of these uh, 802 uh, specifications and you can just even go to YouTube and find a, a short video that explains it. Uh, what's IPv4 and IPv6? Uh, unfortunately or maybe fortunately depending on your point of view, IPv6 is, is really not not that much of a, an issue right now but IPv4 is you definitely need to know how DNS and HTTP work SMTP is not that important, but 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 DNS and HTTP are super important. So a web developer should understand the basics and how to implement them correctly, um, and the ramifications that those technologies and protocols bring. Security very important. Uh, we teach a whole course here at UCF on secure programming and how to write your code so that it is secure. Um, this is one of one of the uh, things about C and C++ is for those languages it's a lot easier to to uh, for people to get in and, and hack them. C Sharp, Java, Python are, are a lot more secure languages. So let's say you're writing a C or C++ program, program and or you're maintaining it, you still have to know uh, some of the security basics so that you can you can write safe code that's not going to be immediately hacked and uh, your, your company goes out of business. Here are some recommendations. Um, learn what social engineering is. It's one of the most common ways that people hack. Uh, buffer overflows. That's a pretty easy concept, but go ahead and um, you know do go through some examples. Uh, integer overflows, uh, code injection vulnerabilities. That's a little more more difficult. Uh, race conditions. I know I teach that in programming languages when um, I teach uh, multi-threading. 
A uh, privilege confusion, um, I don't teach that, but I think that that's taught in operating systems here. So you should have a, a general knowledge of that, at least. So UX, or user experience. I'm going to be the first to admit that, that this is one of my weak points. I'm, I'm not good at it. So a lot of times I have to, I just spend hours and hours um, looking at other people's UX, and, and trying to take take ideas from other people and then once I do a UX I'll put it in front of people and say here you know can you help me can, can you give me some suggestions on how to make this better I've written some of the greatest software in the world and and without a good UX people look at it and say oh that's nice they don't realize you know what you've done and, and that your, your software is actually really good a good UX means you spent the time on the software to, to really polish it so I just want to want to just encourage you that even if you're not necessarily um, shooting for for a program with with a great UX, a great program needs a good UX because uh, a lot of times first impressions are really important. So visualization is about rendering data so that a human can perceive that data as information. And a lot of you are pretty good about this uh, graph, a lot of graphs and. If you had me for programming languages in R, we did a lot of uh, graphing. And a lot of times, if you can tell someone something, but if you show them a graph that, that depicts the, 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 the information you're showing as um, a graphic, it really means a lot more to them, and they, they learn a lot more. Parallelism. Okay, so uh, we have a whole course here, an undergraduate and a graduate course here at UCF on parallelism. I spend like one day in programming languages doing this. So it's not like you're going to learn a lot. You'll, you'll at least get the basics. You need to know something about this. Something about, you know, why are GPUs important? Something about, you know, how do you take advantage of all your CPUs? So you don't need to be an expert, but you at least need to know the basics. So here's some specific recommendations. Um, Try to write some some threading and multi-threading uh, uh, multi-threading uh, applications. And if you have me in, in programming languages this semester, we get to the, that in a couple of weeks. Um, learn how to do GPU programming, and I don't do that in programming languages, but you can pretty much download the CUDA um, kit and go ahead and, and learn. In, in an afternoon, you can get the idea of how to write programs that take advantage of, of GPUs. Uh, with deep learning uh, on the one one use, parallelism needs to speed up the process of deep learning. Like I had a group about a year ago in senior design, and they were doing what's called a fast Fourier transform, which which converts audio signals to uh, frequency, converts from the time domain to the frequency domain, and uh, it was really really slow. And as it turns out, they just had some generic um, Fourier transform code. But something like a Fourier transform is easily parallelizable, so they could actually, you know, rely on all of the, the cores of, of their their, their um, computer. Had they done that, you wouldn't have noticed any slowdown at all. And so it's really important for how you're you're doing software. Um, multi multi threading and parallelism uh, is going to become more and more important um, as, as the years go by. So because programmers generally work in groups nowadays, it's, it's good for them to have a solid foundation in software engineering and the concepts behind it. And that's really what this class is about. This is a software engineering class. We spent the first evening talking about that. Uh, we talked about gathering requirements, uh, doing the UML for, for um, how, how to do all that. Um, so a solid foundation allows for developers to map out what software will look like, right? That's that's what you do before you even start it. Um, that's why those UML diagrams are so important. So you need to know the basics of software engineering, and hopefully at the end of this class you, you will. So here are some specific recommendations for software engineering. Um, all programmers should understand both the underlying workings of version control. That's Git. That's required for you now. So hopefully you got that under control. Along with version control, you, know, you should be comfortable in using a debugging tool, which I know I did that one night. <clears throat> Some of you, I think, were asleep during the whole uh, class, but it was still really important, and I took the time to do it. 
So you can't say you never learned it. You could say you slept during it, but you couldn't say I didn't teach it. Uh, graphics. Uh, most computer scientists generally start off with building games. Um, so anyway, I actually got into programming because of games. Um, I actually, in the early days, I really liked playing games. They, they weren't the, what they are today. Um, and that's really, really how I, how I started. And that's why I got really good at graphics early on. Um, anyway, consider, I know a lot of you don't do any kind of, kind of graphics. Here again, in programming languages, I'm, I'm going to do a, a, a one-day graphics um, lesson in, in C Sharp. And I did a one-day graphics lesson in, uh, I guess it was Python. So it's a really important uh, skill to have. So here's some specific recommendations. Build a simple ray tracer. And you can you don't have to really go all out. You can just use something like um, OpenGL or, or, or WebGL or something like that. Da Dr. Pat and I teaches a really cool class, which I used to teach, um, on graphics. And you know, if you could take that, it'd be it'd be really helpful. Robotics. I learned some robotics of some sort. It's not even that hard. You can even you know um, learn how to use a gazebo, which is a robotic simulator, and uh, use the uh, ROS, which is the robot operating system. Um, you know, just visit the, the robotics club at UCF and you know see what see what they're they're doing and, and try to learn from them. You need to know something about AI. I would say that probably at least twenty percent of all senior design projects have some form of, of machine learning uh, involved in, in them, and so it, it's something you don't want to get to senior design and all of a sudden be oh I got to learn this all of a sudden. Try to take an AI class. I know UCF has an undergraduate as one of the technical electives. Um, you know, go to Udemy and, and take a, a course uh, online. Uh, you know, but you need to know something about AI and machine learning. Machine learning, uh, re very closely related to AI. Um, you need to know. So here again, if I were you, I would go out to um, Udemy or Coursera. Or just get some sort of an online learning course and just go through it. Even just take a weekend. Uh, really, all, all you need is, is a weekend and, and go through it. And you'll at least have some conversational skills. Databases. Unfortunately, we don't we don't require a database class here at UCF. However, we should. And um, I think you, you need to get some sort of database uh, learning. Now, in this class, processes fully fully probably 20 or 25 percent of you are doing database work which is really good some of you got thrown in to the deep end once again on this um, so so learning databases having at least the basic database skills is, is super super important and useful 